Let me give you exactly the same stuff again, but from a different perspective. Actually, I'm only going to give you a fraction of the stuff again. This is the exam content outline, which if you want to download it, you can. You, don't, you may be, but it's in the stuff I've shown you online. It has a bit at the front that says how we're going to do this stuff, and it's dated June 2015, and this is the most up-to-date one. So even though the exam, the book, the book is changing, the exam content outline stays current. Now what the exam content outline tells us is that the exam is based on something called domains. And that's very unfortunate because it's a piece of terminology we don't need. You can forget it now I've said it. Except that the domains are called initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, control and closing. And those are the column headings on page 25. And this, these are domains and page 25, they're process groups. So they're not the same thing, even though they're named identically. What it tells us is the initiating domain contains 13% of the exam questions you're going to get. And you're going to get 200 questions, so you're going to get 26 questions on initiating. But it's the initiating domain. And we just had the conversation over here that says, when a project manager is doing this stuff over here, they cannot be ignoring risk. So the initiating domain says, I'm preparing to get approval at this point. And in order to get approval, I won't have forgotten about risk, even though risk is not in the initiating process group. It's in the initiating domain. So the initiating domain is a bit is taking the lines out on that page 25 and making them a bit fuzzier. What this exam content outline also tells us is that 25 questions in your exam will be presented to you and your marks will be analysed, or your responses will be analysed, so that they can build the, the statistical basis for the scoring of future exams of those questions. So these questions, are te these 175 here, the questions are testing you. These 25 questions, you are providing the test data for them to benchmark these questions in terms of difficulty. You won't be able to tell which questions are these 25. They'll just be in your exam paper. Now what that means is that if, if, if the pass mark as we have come to understand it over the years, is in the order of 60%. And the 25 questions there don't count. Then to pass the exam, you need a score across the whole of the exam of at least 65%, two-thirds, which isn't really a very useful statistic. What I would say to you is the best way to translate it into something that might be useful to you is when you're doing practice exams, if you're scoring under 70, you're in dodgy territory. And if you're scoring over, say, 80, you're in good territory. So one of the questions, how will I know if I've done enough prep, is two answers to it. One is, you're consistently scoring more than about 80%. And the other is, each time you read the wrong answer, the explanation for the question, you go, all oh, right, yes, I knew that. I just didn't recognise it from the way they'd structured that question, but they won't catch me out that way again. So the 20%, so the 80% is your target. The 20% you're not getting are for the ones where you go, well, that was a completely stupid question. There's no way on earth I'm ever going to get that question right. It's just not possible to get that question right other than with a guess. That's your buffer. The, the, the 80 to, to 70 bit is the... Ah, uh, yeah, no, I'm beginning to understand how you put the questions. And I saw that word in there, and I knew that word there was going to be the pivot for which answer was correct. Even though I didn't know what answers were coming, I read that word. For example, implement. That's quite different from plan. Da 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 da, -da implementing. You go, ding, that's going to change the answer. Because if it was da 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 planning, it would be ding, that's going to change the answer. So we have, you have to get to the point where you're sensitive to words. Another example I'd give you is, have you done jigsaw puzzles? You pour all the pieces out of the box, you've got lots of pieces, you have to click them together. When you pour them all out of the box, the first thing you do perhaps is turn them all the same way up, and you pick up a piece and you go, that's green. You pick up another piece and you go, that's green. And you pick up another piece, and that's green. And they're all different colours. And then two days later, you pick up a piece and you go, that's the little girl's dress over there. So now you've gone from it's green to actually it's part of the picture here. 
And that's where we've got to get you to. And you look at an exam question, you go, that word there. You don't know what it means, but you know that that's the thing you need to be sensitive to. So when we look in the exam content outline, we see it has these five domains named the same as the process groups. And you can forget them after this explanation, really. It's going to tell us that across the 49 processes and the 10 knowledge areas and the five process groups, we have what are called domain tasks. And that, I'm going through this simply so I can introduce you to domain tasks and domain skills and cross-cutting skills. And then we have the breakdown of how many questions there are per area, which tells us where it might be more worthwhile focusing our revision effort than, than elsewhere. Because you've got 26 questions in initiation, and going back to the columns on page 25, which is not quite right, there's only two processes. So you're going to get 26 marks out of two processes. Whereas in planning, you're hardly getting any more marks, but look how many things there are in that column. It's enormous. So initiation is a good place to focus. Also, monitoring and control is a good place to um, focus. Executing is a good place to focus in terms of return on your investment of, of study. But this stuff, I need to introduce you, I need to explain this a bit, bit more, because it makes the picture we've just been through link to the exam. Unfortunately, because I'm trying to give you overview, there's some things I haven't shared with you yet that are relevant to this conversation. The PIMBOK tells us a project is divided up into four phases. They are starting, organising and preparing, carrying out the work and closing. And you know from page 25 that it's divided into five process groups. And every one of those process groups is active in every one of the phases, but the emphasis is different. So the emphasis in starting is on initiating, but there's still some closing. And the emphasis on closing is closing, but there's still some initiating. So this stuff I'll explain in more detail. But it's just saying to you that page 25 occurs for as many phases as the project has. Because then we're told, when we're initiating, what we're going to do is perform a project assessment. And we're going to identify our key deliverables of this phase, which at the beginning is the whole project and of the stakeholders for this phase, which at the beginning would include the whole project. But halfway through it, have the, has the stakeholder community changed? You know, imagine, I'm, imagine I'm building an airport. At the beginning, you've got architects. In the middle, you've got people laying concrete. You don't have 50 architects anymore. You've got a couple. You know, do you have a lot of architects at the beginning? Less so in the middle? Because the architects have done the design. But you still need to ask them questions, but you don't need 50 anymore, you only need two. So the stakeholder community will have changed because of the phase changing. We're going to identify our high-level risks, assumptions and constraints. Well, that's all the stuff that's in the second column of page 25, because all the risk stuff is in the second column, none of it in the first column. And this is talking about initiating. But it's the initiating domain, which is why I take the lines out of this page, let the boundaries smudge a bit, and now we have the explanation that's coming up here. We're going to develop the charter, but as project manager and team, we participate. We don't own it. But that means that we need a specific skill, which are elements of project charter. And if we found the right page in here, we could find the description of the project charter. It's somewhere around about page 90, but it's not actually page 90. It's a little bit before that. But don't, don't, don't worry about going and finding it now. Somewhere like 75, 80, somewhere around there. We will get there. Then we're going to obtain charter approval in order to get authority as project manager and hopefully gain commitment from the organisation. And that we're going to also, in parallel with this, conduct benefits analysis, which means we need analytical skills, benefits techniques, estimating techniques, and strategic management, the direction of the organisation because we need our project to be aligned with the strategy. And then we're going to inform stakeholders that we have an approved charter. So the exam is going to be based on this. And this is roughly page 25, but it's not quite. Now, if I was to take the words that are here and arrange them into a sentence, and for each of the activities that's needed here, understand where or not some technique such as active listening or peer review process or relationship management was occurring, I could create a story. 
And that story is this. The initiating domain gathers information using things like meetings and interviews and workshops and analysis on the stakeholders' ability to influence the project, their power and interest. So there I'm going to use stakeholder identification and stakeholder analysis grid tools and techniques. I will assess the feasibility of their expectations for which I need business case benefits analysis, benefits management, realisation plans and strategic alignment. And I will compare all of that with the assumptions, constraints and risks at a high level in order that I can develop and share and receive approval for a charter where actually as project manager I probably do the work but I only do it on behalf of the sponsor who is the real person who owns the charter. So back to the... Got any questions? Is it still going in? Daniel says yes. Anna's okay, Caroline's okay. Okay, so I'll keep going. Okay, you need to tell me when you get overload. Remember I told you this morning, if you were going to read this book from, from scratch, having never seen it before, start on page 540. When you go to 540, which is part two, it's describing the standard for project management. When you start on page... Um, when you start on page 69, page 69 is the beginning of chapter 4, it's the guide to the processes. So in fact what we find is that there is a entry in the guide to the processes and an entry in the standard for every one of the 49 processes. So here is Develop Charter in part 2 of the book and here is Develop Charter in chapter 4. And the text here is identical in both places. When we see it in part two, it's a brief summary that simply tells us what's it about and its inputs and its outputs. So that means you can read the whole story of the Pimbok in the logic that we have been going through it so far, probably in, well, I think it'd be about one and a half IPAs for me. Yeah. IPA, Indian Pale Ale. You get, you know what IPA is? Yeah, you get your, you get your pint of IPA. It's a pint where I live. Well, I, I'd need another one before I'd finish the description of all of these in part two, and I'd probably want another one at the end as well. Just, just. But what it tells us there is, blah, 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 is the process of da, 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 the key benefits of this process, da, 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 the timing of this process, da, 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 da. You want to read those 49 is the process of, the key benefits of, and the timing is. And if you can remember them, fantastic, but just read them. I would actually say write them out if you can stomach it. Depends how much, if you're a, if you're a 75 hour per and do the exam person versus a 300 hour I can do the exam and that might be, I'm going to read them not write them out you can pick them up in either part 2 now the benefit of part 2 is that it goes through the project in the logic order that we've just been through it um, with my one, everything on one page because that's the domain view and that's the exam view the disadvantage is this doesn't tell you the tools and techniques and doesn't tell you a whole lot more detail so if you were to go to chapter 4, the advantage there is that in chapter 4 it's got exactly the same opening words, but it also tells us the tools and techniques, and then following on from this is the actual detail of what the inputs, tools and techniques and the outputs are covering. The major disadvantage is that in order to re read the book in the logic of a project, you have to go, and I'm making the numbers up here, but you have to go page 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 105, 106, 107, 124, 25, 27, 130, 100, 219, 416, and then you come back to the beginning of the book again. My vague, my, my not firm recommendation is that you read in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., 
but you only read the opening sentences and look at the table and then you go to the next process in the, in the order, in, in the logic. Now the reason for saying that is that that way you get to see just how much extra stuff there is in each chapter. So rather, if you were, then if I was talking to you three weeks ago, I'd have said, read part two. The fact that I'm talking to you today, Monday morning of the course, I'm going to say, start on page 64 or whatever it is, beginning of chapter four, but, but don't try and read the whole of each chapter. Just read this opening bit, see this table, page through, just flip over the pages that are telling you what all these inputs and outputs are, and when you have a, a good understanding at that high level, when you have some understanding of that high level, then you can come back and read into the detail below. What you're seeking to do here is understand for the breadth of the questions you're going to get across the processes uh, and um, that are within that, and I, here I'm picking my words specifically, the processes that are within that process group. So that's really saying... If you want to be rigorous and spend a lot of hours, go for the exam content outline and follow the domain. But following the process group is good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. You're getting an idea now across those processes of what's going on at the... Is the, is the process of and the benefits are. And you should also be starting to get a picture, but not you won't be able to internalise it, of what the inputs, tools and techniques and outputs are. Now, if we were to talk about um, the initiating domain, the inputs are business documents, agreements, which is another way of saying contracts, enterprise environmental factors, which is otherwise pronounced politics, organisational process assets, which is otherwise pronounced templates, business documents, which means business case and benefits realisation plan, project management plan, Hang on a minute, how can the project management plan be an input? We haven't created, we haven't got, yes, everything is cyclic. You have to recognise that we might be initiating the second phase of the project. So then a project pl plan would definitely exist. Requirements, and there's a bunch of other fluffy bits too, which I haven't itemised. So I've itemised stuff here that's important. Then we could do the same for tools and techniques, and the same for outputs. And the more that you can get to the point where this starts to make sense to you by the time you get to your exam, it doesn't have to make sense today, the more we can get to the point where that makes sense for you by the time you get to the exam, the less questions you'll get where you'll struggle with them. And remember, when you get a question you struggle with, guess and move on. Yeah. If when you sit in the exam you read a question and halfway through it you, you say, I haven't got a oh no, this is guess and move on, then you're in a good place. So I'm expecting an email afterwards that says, I was sat in my exam and I heard you say in my head, OK, so I, OK, whoever, this is a guess and move on question. Still all right?